Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. The presentation today is very kind given, given by Claudia Trotter from Mates in Mind. Um, the presentation will explore the recent research Mates in Mind has carried out, as well as the benefits of incorporating a mental health programme into your business and the impact it has on the well-being of your employees. So, um, I mean, following the last one was very, very popular, Claudia, and well-received. So thank you for doing this and over to yourself. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so thanks, um, Mark, for the um, introduction and good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I um, hope you're all well. As Mark mentioned, so my name's Claudia Trott. I'm a support manager with Mates in Mind. Um, really happy to be back doing another talk with uh, IQ around mental health in the workplace. Um, it's a topic I care a lot about and very passionate about. Um, and we've got some exciting, um, as, as Mark Messon, uh, mentioned, some research that um, I'm excited to talk about. So some areas we're going to cover in the talk will be looking at um, yeah, well-being, what that can mean in terms of your business, um, some statistics around mental health in COVID times. Imagine you're sick of hearing that word. What you as leaders can do to make change in your company, the mates in mind approach, and, um, and then, yeah, I'll move on to the research. And we can finish with some questions. I'll leave some time at the end. So... Uh, firstly, I wanted to give a bit of an overview of the um, charity. Um, so we're UK, a uh, leading UK mental health charity founded in 2016 by the Health in Construction Leadership Group and the British Safety Council um, in response to the high rates of poor mental health and suicide within the construction industry. So um, the statistic that sticks with me and I, um, someone mentioned the other day is we actually lose two people a day in construction to suicide. Um, so this is what's really pushing all of our efforts. Um, we support organisations <clears throat> across the sector and other industries as well, mostly male dominated, hence why the talk today is called um, Men Do Talk. Uh, to develop sustainable mentally healthy workplaces so help the, um, businesses create communicate and deliver a, a holistic approach to mental health and well-being so when we talk about mental health issues one of us at any time uh, can experience short-term distress uh, and daily um, for some. One in six employees in any given week experience common mental health issues. That's a really sort of important statistic to bear in mind. Um, for one in 100, this progresses into a mental illness. Um, but uh, more recently, research has been carried out that suggests that the, uh, that number is um, higher due to the pandemic. So we kind of can't get through a presentation at the moment around mental health without touching upon the, the, um, the, the pandemic um, and the sort of effects that this has had um, on everybody. So here you can see some statistics around the effect of the pandemic on our mental health. So it's important for businesses to be aware of these statistics. Um, and of course, your employees might be not bringing their whole self into work. So if they're under a large amount of stress, you see here 67% report high levels of stress since COVID-19 began. 57% um, have greater anxiety. If they're under a large amount of stress, this is likely going to obviously affect their performance and can lead to, as you know, accidents in the workplace and long-term absence from work. It also affects all sorts of things such as productivity, um, and that's what we'll move on to next. So what do we need, mean when we talk about uh, stress in, in the workplace? And quite often it's stress that turns into poor mental health or, or poor mental well-being, which turns into uh, or can turn into poor uh, mental ill health. Um, so you can see from this graph that too little stress can mean that employees are bored uh, and therefore not performing well. It's kind of too relaxed. 
um, and they're not challenged in their role. So there's a difference here as well between pressure and stress. So the right amount of pressure leads to good results and it can lead to optimum performance in your employees. However, there does seem to be a point, as you can see, where um, stress becomes more kind of destructive and, and neg have negative effects, um, sometimes causing fatigue, uh, poor judgment, decision making, and um, can even lead to burnout and um, mental breakdowns in, in some. So it's a really important process to be aware of um, within your um, business. As we mentioned, it's going to affect the performance, um, which affects your bottom line um, and overall success as a company. So there, but there are many relatively easy things you can be doing to counteract this um, and cheap. It does, you don't have to kind of overcomplicate the process. Um, there's lots of small things that you can incorporate um, in your processes that can really make a difference and ensure, I guess, that the problem doesn't get to the end of that graph and become a bigger problem that you catch it early. So we encourage our supporters that we work with, we encourage them to carry out regular stress risk assessments uh, in order to identify, mitigate, uh, stressors in, in the workplace um, and outside of the workplace as well. So it's good to carry these out as part of um, one-to-ones actually with um, between managers and, and teammates. Um, it doesn't even need to be um, a, a, you know necessarily a formal process when it happens. It's just if you can get into the habit of doing them, they can be really, really useful in your kind of overall a, a approach and helping people in the company. Um, the risk assessment questions themselves uh, can be just used as discussion points. So it becomes quite a natural discussion where you're taken through how are you feeling about your job demands, um, uh, about changes within your role, um, you know, time constraints, that sort of thing. Um, it really helps doing these regularly and doing these stress risk assessments really helps foster an open culture within the company. It gets people used to talking about stress and how they're feeling and start to communicate um, more, whereas they may have not done so before, or they may not be talking to other people. So it can be a really important um, process in the company. It's kind of making it seem, I suppose, like a normal process to, to talk openly about these things and issues at home as well. Um, it's not the sort of thing where leave your problems at the door. You know, you, when we talk about bringing your whole self to work, um, if you're leaving your problems at the door, you're not, you're not anyway. So it's, it's better that at least your workplace is aware of the issues that you've got going at home, whether that be financial or family problems where... Um, there may be things that your company can do to help. And as managers, you can um, provide that support. And of course, this um, feeds into your legal duty to protect employees from stress at work. So really, the more that you know as an employer, the better you can mitigate risk. Um, so this is why... Um, as a charity, we have a huge focus on company culture. And that's really the kind of um, driving force of our program. And um, it's what we are the most interested in within the organization. So <clears throat> addressing well being isn't just, we don't see it as sort of just putting up some posters or having mental health first aiders present. They're, they're great um, to have those in place, but to address the underlying root um, cause of poor mental health is to really kind of understand your workforce. And sometimes there would be <clears throat> stresses in place that you're, you're absolutely not aware of. So it's, it's, there's no real downside to doing these regular um, stress risk assessments with people and just talking about mental health generally in one-to-ones. In we often explain it in terms of when we talk about company culture, 
uh, and people often kind of laugh when, when we talk about it like this, but when you come out of the bathroom at work, is your boss tapping his watch at you? That's company culture. That's a that's something that's um, or if you had to report an instance of bullying, for instance, would anyone take it seriously? Um, would there be a bit of banter and laughter around it? Um, would they think you were being a bit overly sensitive? Um, these things all feed into it. They're all really small, uh, simple things that um, do um, yeah, f- feed into your company culture as a whole. And it can be the difference of someone feeling like they belong in a company and they trust it and they can speak about their mental health or just being quite reserved about their Um, talking about their problems because there's not that level of trust there and very commonly heard across the construction uh, industry in particular and related industries we don't talk about mental health until it's too late so understanding the impact so although we are working mostly working within male dominated industries as a charity um, we need to acknowledge that men um, in fact do talk um, and they are talking but there's still there's still a way to go yet but I think it's not a good thing to assume that um, they're completely men in general completely shut down and feeding into that um, kind of generalization um, So you can see here when it comes to speaking out at work, uh, generally speaking, only 44% have felt as though they can speak to somebody in their workplace around their mental health problems. Um, Some of the common reasons that people often don't disclose are here. Some of there are others as well. Um, Don't feel comfortable discussing problems at work, want to deal with it alone. Maybe they're used to dealing with it alone. Perhaps they have a very supportive spouse at home um, that they speak to about their problems. Uh, So this is all kind of looking into this wider research is what's prompted some of the the research that we have done into small companies and micro companies and just um, exploring these themes a little bit further. Sometimes there can be a view that speaking about their problems could mean they're not offered the same opportunities as others in the company um, and some employees um, would feel that they would lose their job um, or they'd be let go so the truth is you can get better from mental illness and um, I think that's the messaging that is really important in any general awareness training you, you roll out to employees any kind of communications around mental health it's really instilling the message that you can get completely better from mental health, um, much like a physical uh, injury. Uh, However, some feel that, I suppose, the stigma around mental health is long lasting. And once you're kind of, um, people say, tarred with that brush, then that's it. And you're just kind of that person in in the company. So it can, all of these things can really impact how um, trusting someone is at work that they can speak out. So now briefly just touching upon um, how this has guided our approach and how we normally work with organisations. So a good framework is supposed to use when implementing a mental health programme or strategy Um, in your business is to take a real holistic view on well-being so mate to mind focuses on these areas um, predominantly when supporting organizations Um, we call it a whole organization approach so as I mentioned it's not just kind of the um, posters or mental health first aiders or upskilling managers it's it's everything but also how all of those different services are communicating with each other and how effective they are. And if people are actually reaching out to them and using them. So making the commitment to change is is often one of the first steps actually, um, externally to the wider industry. Uh, And um, if you, 
getting onto a mental health program or working with a charity or um, coming up with a really robust plan yourselves um, and communicating that to the wider industry and sharing any knowledge that you've um, learned is a is a fantastic and powerful thing um, and with your supply chain as well but also internally with employees and really showing that you are committed to the cause. Talking about mental health from the top is, is really key. Uh, it, it sort of paves the way for the um, company culture and it sets an example. So it's, this is how we do things in this company um, and we talk about it right from the top. So we're not just expecting you guys to do it, we're doing it as well taking the time to actually upskill your managers to have conversations around mental health and be confident in having those conversations um, is also really powerful. Ensuring all employees have at least a, a basic understanding of mental health and encouraged to open the conversation with each other, uh, we have found is one of the most kind of um, prevalent ways of people seeking uh, help. The most of the time when someone is struggling, the person they go to, we know that the person that they reach out to in the first instance is the person that's closest to them. That might be a, a friend, that might be a family member, but it quite often is a colleague as well, um, uh, especially in sort of tight knit teams, they get very close. It may be that a colleague that they reach out to in the first instance, and if everyone is confident in having that conversation and everyone feels able to and they know where to signpost to, they know exactly what support is in the company, then you can help very early on in that um, process sometimes of, of someone seeking help. Um, communication. So perhaps rolling out something, um, this is kind of getting feedback as well from your workforce. So perhaps rolling out an employee engagement survey um, that, you know, that's going for the um, kind of evidence led approach. So guiding your mental health program, you've got it, uh, it guided by employees. They've asked, they've asked what they, um, for what they need uh, and then you're taking actions on that that's also ties into the commitment side of it as well so also perhaps reviewing how effective your policies are uh, or if managers are confident in referring to the policies how one-to-ones are uh, conducted how change is communicated um, are your employees represented and listened to are they heard there's so many things that you could explore um, that fit within to uh, that kind of communication um, within the company. And a lot of these, it's worth mentioning, are kind of guided by, our, our framework itself is guided by uh, the HSE standards. Um, so that's generally the, the kind of structure that we, we try to use. So what does good look like? What does a good program look like within a company? So as previously mentioned, our approach is uh, evidence-based, evidence-led. So this means that we um, assess an organization's needs first um, to identify any areas where we can support to optimize their current initiatives. Um, and it's almost like a kind of gap analysis approach where you just look at what's in place and how it can be improved upon. Um, and any business can do this, just have a kind of review of everything, then work to develop um, the program with them, along with guidance from our practitioners who are working in the field. And every program is different, but it needs to align, I think, importantly, to how each business functions um how the businesses even how how big are the teams that people are working in um how um an interesting one is um recently i worked with a um a farming business so all of the um, groups that we were trying to um kind of encourage to seek support and we were trying to 
uh, upskill with some general awareness training to all of these groups. They're all families on farms, just living with each other um, within their family. So the dynamic of the whole company is completely different. Um, so we need to take a different approach entirely with, with that. So um, yeah, every program is different, but it needs to align with the, with the business and be guided by the employees, by their views, by their way of doing things. Um, we then look at the intervention side of things. So there may be mental health first aiders in the business, but no one is actually reaching out to them. Um, no one's using that as a, as a um, support vehicle. So we help perhaps create a mental health first aid model within the business where data is captured. They could, um, we make sure they meet as a group and there's a bit more of structure around everything. Um, general awareness to all employees so, so they have the knowledge to look out for signs in themselves they're struggling, then go speak to the mental health first aider. So it's about that self-awareness side um, as well. Um, perhaps um, looking at general when uh, sorry workshops um, with the mental health first aiders maybe they could run a workshop to talk about your if you have an employee assistance program and how it works and when you call the number what happens um, what's the steps that you would take um, quite often there's um things like this just increase familiarity with the services and that's more likely that people are going to use them if they're familiar they know what to expect um, because calling a random number that your company's put on their website sometimes is scary and you're not sure how to navigate it when you're already feeling vulnerable um, so then we would go on to measure the uh, the impact, and that's a really important step. Is looking at the data, looking at sickness um, and absence data, um, looking at um, how many people are reaching out to the mental health first aiders uh, or the EAP, um, and measuring everything. So at the centre of all of this is that program management. Uh, it would be quite often a, a steering group. Um, is, is a good initiative to put in place who centrally manages this whole process, this whole, um, the whole programme um, and representation within that steering group from the, um, from the company. So you have people of different levels of hierarchy, uh, maybe the mental health first aiders are in, included as well. And what they're doing is they're just overseeing the programme, the process um, and tweaking it as you go. That's like a, a, a project that you're taking on. And leaders, remember, when you talk, others listen. This is really um, very, very true. So I was um, speaking to actually one of my clients the other day, and she's um, the HR manager. And with any new starters that join the um, company, she actually discusses her own mental health with them which seems a bit um scary to most or, or you know it, she's comfortable with it herself um but she when she goes through the induction process and says these are the services that you have access to um i myself have um, a b and c maybe it could be anxiety or whatever it is and and this is how i receive um support in the company it just makes it real to people it sets the tone for the company that this is the space that we're in is that we uh, we do talk about our mental health um and this is our culture from the get-go we're a very open culture and this is how we do things as supposed to sort of from the outset set that kind of um, um you you can trust us you know you're um and and you're anything you disclose is is trusted so that's quite powerful in itself, I thought, where, when she mentioned that as the, um, yeah, the HR manager speaking to people. It does make a difference. So on to our research then. So um, um, it has not been published yet. So these are initial findings. The full report will be ready in March. So these are just sort of some preliminary kind of findings that we've um, uh, that we've got here. 
Um, the next stage that we're going through at the moment is we're from these results here, we've broken it down into doing some focus groups. So we're currently getting some a bit more kind of qualitative data come in. Um, but I thought I'd initially show you some of these results. So they are quite um, interesting and probably can apply to um, your companies. Um, so yeah, Mates in Mind and the Institute of Employment Studies have collaborated on this survey uh, and interviews to understand the causes, um, the sources of support used and which future measure, uh, measures and resources may be uh, needed to support this hard to reach vulnerable group of people. Um, so this is among construction workers in particular and what we've found through kind of anecdotally on um, our phone calls but also looking at um, wider research, the support within larger organisations is often um, pretty good and that they have more of an established mental health program they have um you know a, a great employee assistance program um and they had sort of uh they obviously have a little bit more funding um more people within the company to take on these responsibilities so it can be a little bit more advanced the harder to reach people are the tend to be the micro and small um businesses so when you're thinking of um, this recent looking at this research here, it's important to start thinking, I think, about your uh, supply chain and who you're working with. And are they, do you think the support is actually reaching them? Do you think that they are um, potentially um, struggling and need some extra support there? So it's about kind of thinking about the wider picture, I suppose, in the industry. So we had, um, this is just to give you an overview if you're interested. So we had over 300 responses received. Um, as I said, we're doing some follow-up interviews at the moment uh, with some volunteers. So that's being conducted at the moment. So, and there we go. So we've got some um, headlines here. So these, uh, this was the causes of stress and anxiety in people's responses here. Um, and these respondents reported um, their, their answers, sorry, were quite frequently, most days or always. Um, the headlines you can take from this uh, would be workload. Uh, I feel my um, workload is too high. That's the highest there. Um, colleagues I feel low because of my business partners and colleagues that's a really kind of um stand out one for me um because you know you just think that's so kind of easily um helped or managed um but quite often it can um, be overlooked um then you've got work pressure uh family and financial worries and covid um you, which we would sort of expect those um, especially kind of given the past couple of years everybody has had. So now this is um, interesting in that these are actions when experiencing low mood in the last six months. Um, so uh, as you can see here, back to the title of the presentation, you can overgeneralize by saying um, men don't talk about mental health it's crucial to actually find out where, uh, which support services they are using, um, where they're going to, uh, or who they're approaching for help. So then we can kind of tailor our approach as a charity or within the industry, within companies, um, but also focus our attention on certain support. So the worrying finding um, is that um, over 40% would of respondents would actually consider quitting their job over low mood. Um, we know that alcohol and drug use can also creep up, so that's reported there as well. Um, this is important, I would say, again, when you're looking at messaging to include in resources and support you're providing. Some of these um, 
kind of categories of of you know drugs and alcohol that kind of messaging can be quite key to include um just that you're aware of it it's not taboo subject you shouldn't just keep quiet about it if you're finding that you are you know down the pub every single night and you're you're um coming into work hungover and you you're probably drinking a little bit too much and you're a bit worried about it it's got to be normalized it's just got to be spoken about and then we'll put in the support for you um it's also uh surprising fewer than one in five um people ask their gp for help or speak to their gp um and the same percentage consider self-harm as that they would get counseling uh which is quite a obviously a, a worrying statistic so most people are still and this has been the the same way for quite some time but most people are better at giving than seeking support stigma is um another headline is stigma is still strongly felt by this demographic um you can see there i feel that there is a stigma around mental health which stops people from talking about it um as well as some other questions um were, were around the same themes and nearly 50 percent agreed that it is extremely difficult to talk about their mental health and an interesting one that's come up a few times within this um study actually is that gps are not a favored source of help and quite often, if you think of when someone is struggling, you that's the first place you would suggest they go to is go to your GP, speak to your GP. There, for whatever reason, there's um, there, within this demographic, there's not a lot of trust um, in that as a source of support. Um, so that's where these kind of focus groups will be really interesting to see why that is um, and to understand that in a bit more detail. Um, so I'll go on to the next slide here. So overall themes, um, anxiety, very prevalent in this workforce, um, but mental health stigma and reluctance to seek support make interventions hard to um, target. There's an elevated risk of adopting unhealthy behaviors and even self-harm. Um, Conventional sources of support, such as um, GPs, are not well regarded, it would seem, um, although trade bodies and charity resources might have more impact. That was another thing that, um, that we saw. So really, um, education, risk assessment, prevention, peer support, um should play at least as much part in this and in your approach as crisis management and uh keep in mind so some people as we saw there find it easier to spot issues in others rather than um, recognizing or acknowledging signs in themselves that can take longer we may be more likely to approach someone closest to us before seeking professional help hence why general awareness training for everybody so everyone has a um, basic level of knowledge is really important and just because help is available not everyone will ask for it there are all sorts of barriers um, that people face someone may have not had a good experience with support services in the past it's all sorts of things that can stop someone reaching out so it's not good to assume, um, I suppose, that people are going to reach out. Um, and with your mental health first aiders, their approach should take into consideration these points here, really. So that are they being proactive in their approach? Are they reaching out for one to ones with people? Are they running workshops? Are they making their name um, visible everywhere and their face? And so you know who they are. Um, are they engaging with the employee assistance program? That's another thing that they uh, they can do. Um, and as we said, run a workshop on how how it works to increase um, uptake on uh, the employee assistance program. So 
key messages are to look into your data uh, and look into your processes and review what you have in place. Um, so as we said, there's many barriers to support. There's also many ways to remove those barriers. Um, we find after general awareness training, for instance, um, sometimes that, that prompts people to reach out afterwards, um, especially um, courses where people are encouraged to openly discuss in front of each other um, their experience with mental health. Um, it's kind of a, a creating a safe space for them to do that. So quite often afterwards, it would be um, a self-reflection period for someone where that's when they're likely to reach out to you as the employer for some help where maybe they haven't done that before but it's all that self-reflection is really um, important in general awareness training so this is just our infographic um, <clears throat> around spotting signs that somebody in your team is struggling so um, I, I, you can have a, a, a little read through but Look for changes in behavior. So don't be afraid to start the conversation with someone. They may not be speaking to anybody else at all um, and really appreciate it. Uh, if someone is underperforming, um, so this kind of column on the on the right hand side in blue, uh, it may be that they are experiencing poor mental health, um, especially as we keep saying, after a couple of years we've had, it's very likely um, a lot of people are at the moment. So uh, if there's a change in their work, they're changing their concentration levels or accidents are happening, then um, really kind of delve into that and don't be afraid to open up the conversation. And if you were going to take, I suppose, three key actions home from um, today it would be just make sure individuals are self-aware when we talk about self-reflection um, and that they can ask for help and they know where to find help so really make that um, clear in all of your communications uh, managers are well informed they listen to and they have um, and they're open to having those conversations about mental health um, and it's not something that makes them look like it's yeah, you're making them feel awkward. Quite often that's the kind of response or they don't want to do the wrong thing. And there's a lot of pressure around that conversation. But the more, the more you get used to it, the more confidence you have with those sort of conversations. And your company culture um, is a safe space for mental health problems. So you're addressing the root cause of issues. Um, the day-to-day, -day, the boss tapping his watch, things like that. And that in turn can really help with the prevention method of, um, um, yeah, prevent, preventing any uh, mental ill health. Um, not all, it does happen. And you need to um, ensure you have the right support in place as a safety net. Um, but if you can prevent things really early on, it's going to um, hugely help you in the future. So that's the end of the, the presentation. So I'd love to open up the floor to any questions, if we have time or comments or thoughts about um, the research or anything I've mentioned. So my contact details are here anyway. So if you wanted to ask something in private, um, please do reach out. Um, or if you wanted to work with our charity more closely, fundraise, anything like that, um, or need some advice around a colleague that you're worried about, then do. Um, get in touch we want to help wherever possible um but yeah thank you again for your time today and are there any questions <laughs>